Welcome back to Din and Duff, where we conceptualize halacha based on a particular case study. I'm Alana Steinhain, and I'm so excited to be doing our first sugya in Bav Metziah. And we actually are going to open open our Din and Duff series on Bav Metziah with the opening Mishnah of Bav Metziah. When we see on Bedam and Aleph that we have Shnaim Ochs and Betalis, two people holding a garment, and they're going to Yachloku B'Shvua, they're going to split its value or the actual garment itself, alongside with alongside a shvua about their ownership of it, it sort of feels like, okay, here's the paradigmatic case. And this is basically the template for how we're going to deal with t- contested money or possessions. But the truth is, when we look in other places in Shas, we have other examples of contested money or possessions, and it's resolved differently. It's not yachloku b'shvua. It's other ways. So what I want to do today is I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the range of options of how to deal with contested possessions. And actually, more importantly than what the range of options are, what are the variables that determine when you would poskin like X and when you would poskin like that, like Y, when Baton would force, let's say, a split of the value or of the object, or when Baton would say, you know, um, I don't want to give it away, but when Baton would say, you know what, solve it among yourselves, whoever's stronger is going to win. So I want to think about what those variables are because those variables also tell us something about both what ownership means, is about, how it's proven, and also a little bit about what Baton's function is in situations like this. So let's get started by looking at three different ways that in three different cases, Chazal um, suggest managing a dispute over funds. I just have to share my screen. One second. Okay, you'll see. Let's take a look. So first we have what we think of as our classic case, only because it's the beginning. Which is Bav Metzia Ben Amon Aleph Shnei Bochs and Metali. Two people are holding a garment. Zeomer and Nimetzatia. This one says I found it. Zeomer and Nimetzatia. The other one says I found it. Zeomer Kula Shali. Zeomer Kula Shali. Each one contests that the whole thing belongs to them. Zei Shavah She'elu Pachot Michetzia. One should take a shvua that they own at least half. Zei Shavah She'elu Pachot Michetzia Biachloku. And the other one will take a shvua that they own at least half, and they're going to split it. Beautiful, simple case. But now take a look at Baba Batra Lamadal and Bet, where similar situation and the Psak is different. Hahu Arva, there's a boat, to have Umin Suala Betre, two people were arguing over it over it. Hayamar Didihi, one of them said, It's mine. Bahayamar Didihi. The other one said, No, it's mine. Sounds a lot like the Talis case. Ata Khadminaiwa Beitina. And one of them came to the Beit in Va'amar and said, Tifsua ad maitina sahadi dididihi. Do me a favor, not do me a favor, but do the right thing. Seize the boat until I'm able to bring Adim who say that it's mine. So the question is, Tafsina and Alot Tafsina. Should the Beit in actually take, seize the boat, take um, charge of the boat and not let anybody take it and wait for the Adim? Rav Huna Mar Tafsina and Rav Huna says, yes, they should, right? Like hold it in escrow, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word. Rav Yehuda Mar Lo Tafsina. Rav Yehuda says, no, 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 no. They should not do that. Okay, let's continue. This is Ki'ilu now a story. Azal Velo Ashkaf Sahadi. This person who had asked Baitin, hold on to the Arba for me, hold on to the boat for me, couldn't find any Aitim to say that it was theirs. Amar so the guy said, Apkua, you know, you should let the boat go. And whoever is stronger, me or the other litigant, is going to win and will get ownership over the boat. So the question is, should Beitin, once it has seized the object, should they actually, you know, sort of leave it out there for these two litigants to duke it out? Rav Yudamar, lo makinan. Rav Yudamar says, nope, don't let go of it. Rav Papa Amar, makinan. Rav Papa says, yes, let go of it and let them fight over it. And here's the halacha. Lo tafsinan. Beitin does not take it in the first place. In the case of this arba, in the case of this boat, where they're arguing over, this is mine. No, this is mine. In this case, we don't say achloku. We don't say sell the boat and 
split its value. Instead, we say, Beitin is not going to interfere. Lo tafsinon, they're not going to take the boat into Beitin's possession. Behechatetafas, but if they did, lo makinan, they're not going to let it out. But the point is, the basic psak is, Beitin is just going to let them duke it out. Kol talim gabar. Let them duke it out. What? How come in the Talos case, it's split it with a shvua, and in this case, it's, you know, let the best claimant win, but outside of court. And then I have a third example for you. The third example comes from a Mishnah later in Bab Metzia, which is people use a third party to hold on to their money for them. Shnaim shif kidu etzel echad, two people who deposited their money with a third party, one of them deposited 100 dinars, a mané. The other uh, deposited 200 dinars. Hmm. One claimant says, I'm the one who put in the $200 deposit. And the other one says, no, I'm the one who put in the $200 deposit. So essentially, they're arguing over that extra 100 bucks, right? Because they each at least put in $100. It's just a question of that last, that third $100. So what do we say? Each one gets 100 dinar, and that last 100 is going to stay in escrow, right? Abiyosi disagrees. He actually wants all of it to stay in escrow because it will get the one who's lying to admit that they're lying in order to get back at least 100 uh, zoos of theirs, or 100 dinars of theirs, excuse me. So it's kind of interesting that... Um, in this case, they both say, this last $100 is mine. And we don't say split it. And we don't say, here, I'm going to throw it out there, fight over it. Instead, we say, keep it in escrow until Eliyahu Navi comes and can clarify this for us. So what is it that determines why we do half in one piece? Why we do Kol Dalim Gavar in another case? Whoever strongest wins. And why we do Yehei Munach Ad Shiavo Eliyahu in a third case. So Tosfot at the beginning of Bamitzia takes this on and identifies two different um, concerns or two different variables that are going to determine how Beitin is going to Paskin. Also, I just realized you have the ugly version of this. Let me change it to presentation mode. Sorry about that. Okay. So Tosfut say, via chlok, tema. I have a question. This is Tosfut talking about our first case of Shnaim Ochzin Betalis. Okay. Tema, demai shna meahi de arba. How is this different? Why is this different? Really, how is this different? From the case of the boat. De amar kol dalim gvar. That in that case, we say, whoever's stronger is going to win it. In perech ches karabatin. In Baba Batra. The Yesh Lomar, and here's what I think is the answer. De Olsen Shiny, actually holding the garment is different. Why? De Chashiv Ki'ilu Kol Echad Yesh Loba Bivadai Achetzi. It's as though because they're physically holding it, each one has cert with certainty has half of it. Owns half of it. The Anan Sade, the my the toughest high the day, because we all know that when someone's holding something, it indicates that it's theirs. Okay, so this is the difference between a boat, which no one can hold in their hands, and a garment. In the case of the garment, they're physically holding it, and therefore we say Yachloku needs a shvua, because we're not paskining like Sumchus. Or maybe Sunkos has his own reasons for needing a shvua in that situation. But certainly, half. But in the case of the Arba, where they're not holding it, we're not going to half it. Okay, let's see if more comes up. V'chein, and you know what? This is the same, Seito's vote. V'manish lishi. In that case where one deposited 200 and the other one deposited 100, and it's that third 100 between the two of them that's contested. He says, in that case, he says, the Gemara actually compares the case 
of the Yehei Munach Achievo Eliyahu compares that case to Shnaim Ochzin Vitalis. Chashiv Ahu, there it's considered like what in the case of the deposit? Shahanifkad Tofes Becheskat Shnehem. The Nifkad, the person who's holding the deposit of that third hundred dinars, it's as though the Nifkad is holding it for both of them. And it's as though each of them are holding it. Well, if each of them are holding it, then why don't we split it in half, that third hundred? Well, let's see. Lekach Mishane, that's why the Gemara explains there, that in that case, there's another concern, which is we know that that third hundred dinar is definitely only belongs to one of them. How are you going to say split it? Yes, it's true. The fact that it's in the hands of a third party, it's as though that third party is holding it for both of them. And then it's as though they're each holding half of it, like in the Talis case. But the truth is, we know that the all hundred belongs to one of them and not the other. So ve'ein ha'chaluka yot emet. It isn't. It's not going to be a true verdict. It can't be true to life if you split it in half, right? So he says, and that's why it should be left there. So we have three cases: the case of the talis shnayim ochzim talis, and we say. They're both physically holding it. It's like vade they own chetzi. That's why. Because when people hold things, we assume they belong to them. The case of the arba, the case of the boat, they're not holding it. So Beitin says, yeah, let the best person win. The case of this one deposited $200 and this one deposited $100, and they're both claiming they deposited $200, Yes, it's true that that last hundred, it's as though it's in both of their hands because it's in the third party's hands. But to split it 50-50, nobody's claiming that they have, they put in 150. That last hundred dollars belongs to only one of them. So what Toast would have done if they, is they've surfaced for us two different variables that matter here. One is physical muhsakut, holding something, indicates possession. And the other is, is it possible that the chaluka is true? Because if it's not possible that the chaluka is true, we don't want to split it in half, even if both of them are holding it. So in the Talis case, how do I know that it's possible that they both, that they each have half? Well, take a look. Aval Talis, but concerning a talit or concerning a garment of any kind, where it's possible to say that it belongs to both of them because it's a metziah, it's something they found. Maybe they literally found it at the same time. In that case, because the chalukah, because the having, halving, can be true, we split it, right? And then Tosfot adds another example. Similar to a Gemara on Zayin Amad Aleph, where two people are holding a star, Mishum Dishnei Madukimbo, because they're both holding it, it's possible that they really each do get half of what's in that star. It's possible that one of them has already paid the other one half of what the contract, the star, is asking for. But uvemane, but in the case of depositing a hundred dinars, ain't derech sheyaknelo hachetzi achareshu biyad chaviro. It's not. It doesn't. It's not the usual way that, like, I deposited money, and then I say to somebody else, "Oh, half that half of my money that's in the deposit, you can have." Like that's not a normal way to do business. I'm not like oh, my stuff is in the bank, you can have half of it, right? Like what you would do is you would withdraw it from that third party and then give them money. So to say, oh, maybe when we each gave money to that third party, what happened was I gave 200 dinar, you gave 100 dinar, but once the money was already in the hand of the Nifkad, 
I said to you, by the way, I want you to have 50 of those dinar. Unlikely, right? So the chaluka ain't in chalaliot and met, right? Aval, be'arba. Now let's get back to our boat because I now I get it, meaning I understand. We don't know what to do with that, the third hundred dinars. Got it. It's as though they're both holding it, but at the same time, Chaluka doesn't, it can't be, it can't be true, right? Talis, I get it. It could be true that they both own it and they're physically holding it. What about this Arba situation? I understand they're not holding it, but why call Dalim Gabar? So Aval Ba'arba, in the boat situation, even though it is possible that the boat is co-owned by them, because they're not holding it, we say, may the strongest claimant, physically strong it could be, claimant win, right? So there's something about the fact that you need both muhzakut, physical holding, and you need chaluka yichola liot emet. And you need the possibility of the division of the object to actually comport to reality that you both own something, right? Now, what I find interesting about this is that muhzakut feels like it's teaching us about possession and um, Chaluka Yechola Liot Emet feels like it's teaching us about the laws of Beit Din, right? They don't want to do a Chaluka that can't be true. This is not like we're trying to do a compromise. We're trying to do a Pshara. We're actually trying to get to the truth here, right? So that's important to note that two people come and they can test something. You know, Beit Din is not just like, okay, you can have half, you can have half because you can test each other's claims. It's, that's not what we're looking to do here. We're actually looking to figure out the truth. Now it's possible that people could talk about muhzakut as something that is a tool of Beidin to figure out what the truth is, right? It's like a bureau, like it makes it clear that you own it. It's part of, it's evidentiary, you might say. But it is interesting. You could possibly look at these two things as kind of a, a separate piece. Tosva goes on to say something that I think we're going to, um, ah, no, let, let's do, actually, let's do the next part of Tosvo. So this all seemed to be working according to Rabbana, okay? Who Rabbana usually are Hamotzi Mechavera Lavaraya, right? So when they're both holding it, they're both Muchzakim on it. Ula Sumchos, so what about Sumchos? For him, Afagav de'in Muchzakim though. He doesn't, it doesn't bother him uh, if they're not holding it. And even if the division can't be true, meaning it's unlikely or like impossible, highly, highly, highly improbable that they both own it. For Sumchus, that's not the issue, right? Sumchus is essentially saying contested money, you split it and that's it. It says, but... When doesn't it matter? It doesn't matter. When there is a situation where even without anybody claiming anything, it is by definition questionable. Now you saw this in the Gemara and Balakama, right? An ox gores, you know, a mommy cow and the mommy cow has a baby next to it who, when you come to the scene, is Nebuch, gored and dead, right? Now the question is, did the goring happen while the baby was in the inside the mother? If so, the owner of the ox has to pay. Or did the goring happen just to the mother and the baby was already outside of it and maybe the baby died some other way, right? So like, and then the owner of the ox doesn't have to pay. That is an objective question. That's not because somebody claimed this is mine, this is mine. This is just, you come to the scene and you you actually don't know. So in those cases, some folks would say, even if people aren't holding it, even if the chalukah can't be true, in this case, the only way we can do this is split it, right? Perush, shalobetan otam yesh safek, 
explaining what Gerard de Mamona is, that without their ta'anot, without their claims, there's a suffix for Beitin, they're going to split, okay? So it's interesting to see, you know, Sumchus' yachloku of Gerard de Mamona, where they're not even holding it, it doesn't even have to be emet, and, you know, Rabbanan's yachloku of, we assume that because you're mochzak on it, you're holding it, it belongs to you, and therefore, right, and the chalukah yecholal yot emet, so in, in both cases, whether the Gerard de Mamona case for Sumchus or some of these other cases for Rabbanan, it's going to be half, but these are coming from very different places and therefore the variables are very, very different. For Sumchus, the variable here is Gerard de Mamona, just having there to be a question even without your tainas, even without the claims of the two um, litigants. Okay. I also want to show you the re migash. Now, the re migash, this is like, I don't know, maybe it's an incredibly comprehensive umbrella that he gives us of different situations and how we pask in the different situations, right? Tos would have just taken us on three cases the talis, the arba, and the, um, you know, meazuz, the extra mea dinar, the mane. That's what I should say. And the mana, the remigash is going to go a little bit less, um, you know, just about cases and a little bit more giving us categories, which I think is helpful. So the remigash is on Bavabatra on the Kol Dalim Gabar case, the case of the boat, where we say whoever's strongest can take it. So he says, Machavarta de Haidina de Homidi de Minsuale Betre. He says, here's what's clear. The rule that anything that people are fighting over, and one says, this is mine, and the other one says, this is mine. If one of them is physically holding it, who passed like Rabbanan? The burden of proof is on the other person who's not holding it. I don't have to tell you much more. Like that's kind of obvious. So that's one category. They argue over something, but one of them is holding it. Looks like Musakut holding it matters a lot. But what about this? But if they are both holding it, the Kanak delay, and they're holding it. I don't know, they're holding it and they're holding it. Pal delay bishvua. We divide it, but each one has to take a shvua, right? Vahainu ditznan bereish mitzia. That's what we say at the beginning of a mitzia. Shnaim ochzin betalis. Two people holding the garment. Zel merani misatia vule. This one says, I found it. This one says, I found it. This one says, it all belongs to me. This one says, it all belongs to me. It says, by the way, I would say the same thing, not if they're physically holding it, but if the object is found in their joint jurisdiction, meaning in their joint reshut, on their joint property. Or maybe I guess you could envision like maybe their properties abut each other and you could have one object where half of it is in one and half of it is in the other. But I find it like easier to assume that it's a joint piece of property. Okay, so that's our second, right? If it's in one, that creates the muhzakut, amotzi mechavel avaraya, the other person has the burden of proof. It's a, if it's in both, then we are going to split it using a shvua, whether it's physically in their hands or it's in their reshut, it's in their property of both of them. Okay, what about if it's neither of those situations? And if it's not in either of their hands, if it's in the hand of a third party, that's our manek case. It will sit in escrow until Eliyahu comes and clarifies. And that's the mission that we learned before. Two people who gave a deposit to another person. One gave 100, the other one gave 200. Each one claims that it was the 200 that they deposited. And they each take only a hundred zoos home or a hundred dinar home. And they, the rest of it is waiting until Eliyahu. 
Okay, great. So that's what we have in the hands of one of them, Hamotim Echavel Baraya. In the hands of two of them, Pligi Bishvil, right? Pali Bishvil, split it in half. The, in the hands of neither of them, Yehemunach Achievo Eliyahu, if it's in the hand of a third party. What if it's not in their hands and it's not in the hand of a third party? Take a look. who, if it's not in the hand of a third party, instead it's just sitting in the Rishut Rabim. Or it's sitting on some random property that doesn't belong to either of them. If their taina, if their claim is something where you can ultimately prove it, right? Then, one side, they're giving you an example of where you might be able to prove it. You may be able to find out. One says, this is mine. The other one says, this is mine. This one says, this is my parents. This belongs to my parents. It is possible that Adam will come and will side with one of them. Because we can at some point prove it, we are not going to split it. Not because they're not not because they're not touching it and holding it like Tos would say, but because it is possible that someone's going to come along and say, this belongs to so-and-so. Ella called Alim Gavar. Instead, the Beitin is going to say, whoever is stronger gets it, and the other person then becomes the other person then becomes, if they want to take it out of that person's hands, they're going to have to bring Adam in order to do it, right? So this is a little bit different than what we saw in Toast Vote, which is, you know, it's not in the hands of one of them. It's not in the hands of both of them. It's not in the hands of a Shalish. It is out there in the Rashid Arabim, or it's in some Rashid that doesn't belong to either of them. And it is possible that Adam might come and tell us something. And therefore, Beitin is not going to split it. Last case, the e lekala mekam ala demilta. What if it's a situation, it's not in the hands of one of them, it's not in the hands of two of them, it's not in the hands of a shalish, a third party. It is not something where you can have Edim come and tell you. Kigon, such as, tahavaleahu midi, midi de istapak le meikara. Like something where the certain the uncertainty is from the beginning. The Havale Mamun Hamutal Bisafake, meaning it's money that is questionable, meaning the belonging of it is questionable. Hecha de Ika Drar de Mamuna. In a case where there's Drar de Mamuna, meaning there's already, without anybody claiming anything, there's already a question. Kigon Hamachlif para Bechamor Bhule Yachlok. Right, like the case where we um, we bartered a para for a donkey, and it turns out the para has a baby there. Was that before? Was that after the transaction? Whose is it? That's Dimamona. That's not because of somebody's claim. That's we actually factually don't know. Right. So then yachlok, we're back to let's split it up. Right. Now, let's split it up. He doesn't say with a shua. He just says, let's split it up. And he doesn't clarify whether he he sounds like he's talking about even Rabbanon because he started with Hamotzi Mechaber of Araya. He didn't start with Sunkos, right? Okay. And lastly, okay, we have a situation. It's not in the hand of one of them. It's not in the hand of two of them. It's not in the hand of a shalish. It's not something uh, where you have Edim who are going to be able to tell you about it, Right. And it's not something where there's drawer de mamuna. It's there's not something where it's already um, a safe mine ube within itself. The hecha de leka benaihu drawer de mamuna. And when there is no drawer de mamuna, kigon bet staro tayotin beyom echad, like two starot that have the same date, we say, shuda de daini. Kishmuel. There, we're going to follow the discretion of the judges. Tekai Milan Kishmuel. I assume this probably said at some point. Tekai Milan 
Kishmuel, the DNA, I'm not sure, but I'm going to have to look it up. But either way, it's, it's going to be at the discretion of the judges. So here you have a really broad spectrum that the Rimigash has given you of categorizing how we determine. And he has added some variables, right? From Tosvo, we already had the variables of muhzakut, meaning somebody physically holding it in this situation. We already had the variable, we had the variable of what's possible to be true, what, what's a possible verdict that's true and what's not, right? And we also already had the variable of Gerard de Mamona, which comes right from uh, the Gemara. But the Rimi Gash gave us a few other things to think about. He gave us the question of, is it possible that Aiden might come and tell us something about this situation? And that is something that stands in contrast. It seems like, I'm not going to say contrast. Say that's something that seems to be independent of like hachaluka yecholaliot emet or not. It's more like let's wait. But it's interesting that that doesn't lead Baton to seize the object. It leads Baton to say, "All right, fight over it, and whoever gets it, the other person is a motzimechaver lavaraya, and they have to bring um, Baton." I hope. Oh, actually, I want to do one more thing. I want to do one more thing, right? Tosvot and Bavabatra give yet a third reason why in the Arba case we say called Alim Gavar, and that is Ba'arba Kevan de Ikaramai because one of them is lying. Lo yachloko. We're not splitting it. Elahave Dina Kol Dalim Gavar. The din is uh, whoever is strongest is going to get it, right? So we have three different reasons for why we pass in Kol Dalim Gavar from three different Rishon. I mean, all, not all the Balei Tosfot are the same. I hope that what this did for you is it gave you like a quick overview of something that sometimes feels a little bit messy and a little bit confusing. Like, why is this case different from that case, right? So we're starting to make a little bit of Seder even as we start Bavmetzia. Enjoy your learning and we'll see you next week. 